Today's video is going to be how to plow a zero tolerance commercial parking lot. This is just the easiest way and the best way in my opinion to take care of a zero tolerance parking lot. Just some information about this parking lot. It's a 500 square foot hospital. Um, it has a emergency facility. It has a ambulance facility that are open year round 24 seven. Um, this is a 100% salt application parking lot. There is no sand, um, just pure salt. And basically we are to keep all areas of this hospital essentially cleared at all times during the storm. Um, typically we have uh, this loader going. It is a 30,000 pound JCB 427 payloader. Uh, we have a 14 foot Arctic on it currently. We also have two JCB skid steers on site. Both have Arctic pushers on them, one eight foot and one ten and a half. And we essentially take care of the entire property with skid steers and a loader. We have a couple trucks on site too, uh, but they're mainly just to salt and not to plow. Basically how I treat this parking lot is I start plowing when there is a half an inch of snow on the ground and I never really let it accumulate more than an inch to an inch and a half. So this video is going to give you maybe some tips and tricks on the best way to plow your commercial property and also maybe how to budget or give an estimate on to plow a commercial property about this size. This is my second year doing the hospital. Um, I have it under contract for the next five years. I've done multiple different strategies, multiple different tactics on how to efficiently plow this place. And I do believe uh, my team and I have it figured out in most efficient way to plow it. And I'm gonna show you how. First things first uh, with your commercial property is I always try to have somebody on site before the snowstorm starts. Um, and the reason why I do that is the worst time to be out during a storm is always the first 30 minutes. The state of Maine and the towns maybe haven't gone to every spot on the road and maybe dangerous driving. So the last thing I want is somebody to be driving during those dangerous conditions and possibly crash before they even get to the commercial property. Um, the next thing I would recommend is having the best equipment that you can possibly buy with your budget. Um, this is going to make your life a lot less stressful, uh, make your life plowing a lot easier if you invest in the proper equipment. Another thing before we get started is having the right people, um, having people that you trust, um, having people that you know are going to actually get out of bed and be on call because uh, the worst thing you can have is to call someone to go up and plow and they're not answering their phone or you can't get a hold of them. Having somebody reliable, good and trustworthy can potentially be the biggest deal. Alrighty, so uh, we're gonna get plowing here. So there's probably a little less than half an inch on the ground right now, but it's the first snowstorm of the year and I'm really excited to plow, so I'm gonna do it anyway. So the first piece of advice that I could give you is to utilize your equipment. So for me, it makes sense to put my biggest machine on my biggest parking lots. And it makes sense to put my small maneuverable skid steers on the smaller, tighter parking lots. So uh, this is uh, obviously, I mean, it should be pretty common sense, but I do believe that's a uh, extremely big deal. Just another thing really quick that you should be doing is utilizing your pusher. Um, one thing I watch, I watch a lot of YouTube videos of guys plowing and stuff, and one thing that seems to be pretty common is guys seem to be picking up their pushers an awful lot on zero tolerance parking lots. So if you're plowing a zero tolerance park, if you're plowing a zero tolerance parking lot, you're plowing very often. As you can see, I'm barely really plowing anything right here. And it wouldn't make much sense for me to empty this pusher before it's actually filled. So what I like to do is figure eights. So in every parking lot, I will literally go around and I will start from the inside and work my way out. I will fill up my pusher until snow actually starts falling out of it. So I wouldn't go and just do one loop around this place. 
and empty my pusher halfway full. That's going to not be very efficient. So I'm on my second loop and I still don't have any snow falling out. Instead of actually emptying my pusher out, you know, maybe three, four, maybe even five times on this one parking lot that I'm in, I keep my blade down the entire time. Um, this way it saves me time in the long run. And that's really the most efficient way that you can plow a parking lot. It is critically important, not only for snow removal reasons, but for other reasons as well, where you put your snow. So we try to put the majority of our snow in low spots. So if I was to put all my snow from this parking lot into a high spot, in the next sunny day, a lot of that snow is going to melt and it is going to make a lot of runoff, which is going to cause me to have to come back and salt where that runoff was. So if you can pick where your snow is going to go for the most part, it should be in a low spot where runoff won't be an issue later on. I do the biggest and the most important ones with this big loader here and two skid steers work in unison to tackle these smaller parking lots. Um, obviously for me to work around cars um, is much harder for them to work around cars. But when I'm putting snow, I'm constantly thinking of runoff. Where is the snow going to melt to? And your goal should be to not have your snow piles be melting on pavement. So your priority should be your main entrances and your main walking paths. So at this hospital, the main foot traffic and the main traffic from all cars are from the main entrance to the main entrance of the facility to the emergency center or the main walk-in. Um, this is where older people or maybe people that um, have the potential of slipping easily are constantly walking and those areas obviously have the highest concern because it doesn't take much for somebody to slip and fall and that could obviously be catastrophic. I have art exceptional snow pushers and I'm a big fan of theirs. Um, it can cut back your salt usage. Um, they do a much better job scraping and contouring the lay of the land much better than a traditional um, rubber blade snow pusher. Um, so they will salt either after the second time we plow an area or the third time. So what happens with a traditional rubber blade is essentially after you scrape the snow, it becomes extremely slippery. With these Arctics, you're able to get away with two, sometimes even three plows before it gets slippery again. After about two or three rounds of plowing the same spot, I will get into the salt truck and I will actually re-salt the areas that have been plowed multiple times. So overall, in my opinion, if you're plowing a big commercial place like this, um, any small storms, you know, five inches or less is completely doable with uh, multiple skid steers or trucks. Anytime you have a foot or more, I'm going to greatly recommend that you have a payloader. Um, the payloader doesn't really speed up the process when there's only like three inches of snow, but the payloader will speed up the process if there's like a foot of snow. Um, if you're able to push snow banks back better, you're able to sack and higher. And it's really nice, obviously, having a heavy duty or plow on to carry more snow and all that. Um, I believe that skid steers and loaders are far superior than pickup trucks uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, your visibility is going to be much better in a piece of equipment, number one. Uh, number two, you're going to have better maneuverability with a skid steer and, dare I say, even a loader. Um, this loader articulates and it works around cars extremely good. A truck, not so much. Um, with a skid steer, you can turn on a dime and plow both ways on a parking lot. With a truck, you can really only plow one way unless you want to do a 16 point turn at the end and plow the other way. So uh, I'm not a big truck guy. The best bang for your buck is going to be a skid steer, in my opinion. 
Um, skid steers are really easy to train guys in. Um, I got a, a new, brand new guy actually in a skid steer right now. I'm not even watching them because I'm not concerned. Um, and then it's obviously a lot harder to train somebody in this machine. So just kind of keep that in mind too. Um, obviously price wise you're going to be spending about $200,000 or more for a loader like this while the skid steer you can get away with I think I got a small one for like 40 grand or something like that it was like brand new so uh, obviously it's a big savings and I just want to buy two skid steers but every parking lot's different we have a parking lot over here that we're working on and we need to transfer the snow to a different parking lot across the road so right now and this is a case of where I'm backing up a lot and people may say well you're backing up too much for that and it goes to my point of you know try and keep your pusher down as much as possible but sometimes you need to do it um, and it works best if you get the snow piled up here and push it all, all at once so um if you have brand new pavement and good smooth flat pavement um honestly you, you're probably going to be fine with a, a traditional rubber blade. If you have old shitty pavement, I would highly recommend spending the extra money and getting an Arctic. So the Arctic obviously is going to uh, contour the lay of the land much better. Obviously it is going to scrape much better to use less salt, uh, which is huge too. But if you're um, milling your salt per ton, like I said you should, you know, our rubber blade's really not the end of the world, so no big deal. Just real quick, my thoughts on pre-salting. Um, so the way I do this parking lot is, at the end of the storm, I will pepper this place. Uh, there'll be so much salt here, it'll look like a fucking salt mine. I'll pepper this place for my last application, and for the next storm, when I show up, there's still salt there. So uh, that's how I treat it, um, that's how I'll probably always treat it. Obviously, if it rains and it washes away the salt then yeah it'd probably be worth uh, salting um, as far as um, pre-salting just to pre-salt um, what i would recommend is and obviously if if salting is part of your contract do not pre-salt do not do that that'd be a tremendous waste because that'd be a huge loss of profit but if salting is part of your if salting is build out per ton I would definitely salt. Um, I probably wouldn't go overkill and get every nook and cranny, but I would definitely get your main driving grounds and your main walking grounds. Um, definitely do that. Um, it does make it nice just in case something happens and you're not on the ball ready to go once the first snowflakes fall. Um, at least you have that salt there for a nice cushion for an hour or two. Um, so those are my thoughts on pre-salting. Another uh, tip I can give you guys is work together. Um, you know, maybe there's cases where you guys don't work good together but I'm telling you if you guys if your team can figure out a way to push snow to each other and work in unison that is the way to go obviously if you are extremely crowded and you can't work together and there's not enough space then I get it but if there's enough space I can't tell you how important it is that you work together you can get so much more accomplished and done in a fast in a very short amount of time as you can just by yourself I'm going to recommend backups. So for my company, I have four guys that plow. And in my company, I have eight things to plow with. So essentially what that means is if somebody breaks down, everybody has a backup plan. Um, that's extremely important. Obviously, I get that that's a lot of backups. I mean, having four backup things in a company is pretty damn good, in my opinion. But if you can justify having four, if you can justify for everyone having a backup, that's the way to go. I would strongly recommend figuring out your monthly cost of overhead. So figuring out what your company spends in a month. You know, you get to factor everything in from payroll, you get to factor in all loan expenses, you have to factor in all your gas, you have to factor in all your insurance, you have to factor in taxes, you get to factor in everything that you can possibly think of. You get to factor in for breakdowns, you get to factor everything. 
and there can't be anything that you miss. You have to figure out what your monthly overhead is for your company. In my opinion, you should have that much money in contracts, guaranteed, no matter what. So, so if it doesn't snow, you're covered. You don't have to worry. So the way that I would bid, or the way that I would have a dream plowing contract set up is, A is you need to have a contract set in place uh, that covers either the winter months or every month year round. Um, for me, it makes sense to do a plowing contract where it does not matter how much snow we get. Um, we plow and there's no extra charge. It's just one monthly fee spread out for six months. But what I would recommend you do is have your salt charged per ton applicated. Um, salt can be extremely expensive. Salt can increase in price very drastically throughout the year. Um, you can have a year of just nothing but freezing rain events. And if you have your salt in contract, that could be very catastrophic. Much better idea to actually have the plowing in contract and have the salt be billed completely separately per ton. Uh, salt can make or break you in the snow industry and it's very important that you're covered just in case you use more than expected. What I also would do is anytime that you are required to either truck snow out or push snow banks back, I believe that that should be a separate entity as well. Um, I believe that should be a hourly rate of loader work, maybe skid steer work, maybe have a dump truck hauling fee. Um, because like again, if you get hammered with snow, and maybe you have to subcontract out trucking or subcontract out another loader to come in and help you. Um, you need to be covered in those certain situations. And that's just common sense because obviously you don't want to get hammered with snow and try to underbid everyone for these contracts just to get it. Um, so having those two separate salting and loader work is definitely a very good idea. And I would recommend that completely. Obviously if you guys have any other questions or something that I missed, uh, comment it down below. Um, but those are essentially my thoughts. Uh, thanks for watching.